Hey guys, welcome back and thank you for choosing to hang out with me once again. This week I'm discussing another movie that was inspired by true events, Wolf Creek. If you haven't seen Wolf Creek, it is an Australian horror film that was released in 2005. It's a gore horror, kind of in the same vein as Hostel, so if you're squeamish, viewer discretion is advised. The story plots three backpackers out exploring the Australian outback when unfortunately their car breaks down. Luckily, a kind man named Mick Taylor goes out of his way to provide the group with a ride so they can get parts to fix their car. But in true horror movie fashion, Mick is not who he appears. In reality, he is a sadistic serial killer who's done this before. This new group of victims are horrifically hunted and tortured in a brutal fashion, but do they survive? I don't want to spoil it for you. The film boasts that it's based on a true story, and this is sort of half-truth, since the events portrayed are not exact, but rather Mick is based on a real-life killer who was coined the backpack murderer. So I invite you to join me as we discuss the real crimes of Ivan Malat. Sit back, relax, and let's dive in. Ivan Malat was born on December 27, 1944 in Guildford, New South Wales, Australia. His father was a Croatian immigrant while his mother was a native Australian. Ivan was the fifth of 14 children and displayed alarming signs at a young age. He had antisocial behaviors which led to him completing a stint in a residential school at 13. He quickly became well known amongst local law enforcement. By 17, he was already serving his first sentence in a juvenile detention center for theft. His crime spree was just beginning. By 19, he committed his first breaking and entering, and shortly after being released from this sentence, he was arrested again for driving a stolen car. For this crime, he was given two years of hard labor. At the age of 22, he was again arrested for theft and received another three years in jail. In April of 1971, freshly out of jail, Ivan pushed beyond theft. Ivan picked up two young female hitchhikers at a nearby train station with the intentions of a ride. He quickly pulled out a knife and bound the girls, telling them, quote, I'm going to kill you. You won't scream when I cut your throats, will you? End quote. Both were held captive for a brief period with one of the girls suffering from assault. The pair were able to convince Ivan to stop at a service area for drinks. With the help of bystanders inside of the station, they managed to escape, but so did Ivan. It was temporary, though. He was arrested and charged with two two counts of armed robbery, kidnapping, and assault charges. Instead of facing the consequences for his actions, Ivan faked his own death. Later the same year, investigators discovered he had actually fled to New Zealand and wasn't dead at all. He was rearrested in late 1974 when he was forced to return due to his mother suffering from a heart attack. Ivan managed to escape conviction on all charges due to police procedural negligence. Done with his legal woes, Ivan gained employment as a truck driver. Yet, he couldn't quite shake the thrill of what he had done, and decided to up the ante one more notch. Between 1989 to 1993, hitchhikers began to disappear without explanation. In December of 1989, a 19-year-old Australian couple vanished on their way to a festival. In January of 1991, a 20-year-old German woman also went missing. The following year, another couple disappeared in January. And finally, two women in their early 20s were gone without a trace in April of 1992. All of the individuals were staying in Sydney backpacker hostels. They all informed relatives and friends of their plans to head south along the Hume Highway, the main road between Sydney and Melbourne. When they neglected to check in, families grew concerned and law enforcement became involved. On September 19, 1992, runners stumbled upon a decaying corpse in Belangolo State Forest in New South Wales, Australia. The concealed corpse was found face down in the dirt with their hands tied behind their back. The following day, police found a second body while investigating the initial discovery. Dental records identified the bodies as Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters. Both were British women who arrived in Australia separately but became quick friends and decided to travel together. In April of 1992, they left Sydney and hitched hike to Bully Pass where they were last seen asking directions to the Hume Highway. 
Joanne was stabbed multiple times, some of which severed her spine, which would have left her paralyzed. Carolyn was shot several times in the head, and police believe she may have been used as target practice. A thorough search was performed at the time, but no further evidence or bodies were discovered. The following year, in October, a man named Bruce Pryatt discovered a skull and femur in a remote section of the forest. Bruce had been conducting an amateur investigation, trying to find continued evidence after the discovery of the previous remains, since it appeared law enforcement had lost interest. Two more bodies were discovered once police became involved, and they were identified as Deborah Everest and James Gibson. The pair reportedly checked out of their hostel in Sydney's Surrey Hills in December of 1989. They were heading home to Melbourne when they made a planned stop at a conservation festival in Albury, but were not heard from again. The day after they left Sydney, Gibson's damaged camera were discovered along with his backpack by the roadside of Galston Gorge in northern Sydney. Gibson's skeleton displayed stab wounds and much like Joanne, his spine was also severed. Everest was savagely beaten with her skull being fractured in two places, jaw broken, and knife marks on her forehead. In November of 1993, another skull was found in the forest once again. The remains were soon identified as being those of Simone Schmidl. Simone was a tourist from Germany who left Sydney on January 20th, 1991. She planned to hike to Melbourne to meet her mother who was flying from Germany to join her on a camping trip. She was last seen at the Sydney railway station where she was catching a train out of the city. Her mother arrived two days later and Simone never showed. Her mother stayed for six weeks searching for her daughter with no results. Simone's skeleton showed stab wounds, one of which severed her spine. Clothing was found at this scene which did not belong to her, but matched that of another missing person, Anya Habshid. Two days later, on November 3rd, police would find the remains of Anya and her boyfriend, Gabor Nubar. They were buried in shallow graves about 160 feet apart. The couple left the Backpackers Inn in Sydney's King Cross on Boxing Day of 1991 with plans to fly back home to Germany. They were last seen a few days after they left Sydney in a caravan park in Darwin where they had missed their flight. Near the bodies, discarded airline tickets were discovered. Anya had been decapitated and despite extensive searches, her head was never recovered. Gabor had been shot in the head. All of the bodies discovered were posed face down with their hands behind their backs and had been covered with sticks and ferns. Remains of fires encircled by stones were found near all of the bodies, suggesting the killer had camped before leaving. Amongst other common factors at the scene were shell casings of the same caliber, beer bottles, cigarette butts, duct tape, and ties used for bounding. Police had a long list of suspects with no way to narrow down who was responsible for these murders. The news was released regarding the various bodies being found, which sparked an interesting tip that had gone neglected for years. Paul Onions, on January 25, 1990, had set out to Australia to go backpacking. He took a train to the Hume Highway to get to Victoria to earn money. While hiking, he came across a roadside transport cafe. As he was preparing to set off, a mustached Australian man named Bill walked over and offered to give him a ride. Paul stated the man seemed genuine and friendly, so he willingly took the free transport. Along the drive, Paul talked about himself and his plans, and Bill returned the favor. Bill stopped the car near the entrance of the Belangolo State Forest, stating he needed to find his cassette tapes that were under the seat before proceeding. He climbed out of the car, and Paul felt suspicious, so he followed him out to stretch his legs. After a few seconds, they got back inside the car, but Bill stepped out again and started rummaging under the seat. Only this time, he produced a revolver and pointed it at Paul. He reached again and pulled out a bag of ropes, but Paul wasn't waiting to see what was going to happen, so he ran for it under gunfire. Bill managed to catch up and drag Paul to the ground, but Paul was able to wiggle free once more and continued to run. A car driven by a woman and her family crossed his path, and fortunately, they stopped and allowed him to jump into the back seat. Paul recalled how Bill stood on the roadside with a sick grin on his face as he drove away. Paul was taken to the police where he provided all the details he could. This included Bill's appearance, vehicle, and occupation. Staff, though, didn't seem to take his claim seriously, so a report was filed and Paul was given money so he could go to the British High Commission in Sydney to return home. The entire ordeal would be forgotten about until Paul attempted to contact the authorities after the bodies began to turn up. His call would go unnoticed for five months before a detective would discover the note regarding the call on April 13th 
1994. The superintendent immediately called for the original report from Bolrell Police, but it was missing. Fortunate for the investigation, a constable involved took a full report which provided more details than the original. With these new details, police were able to narrow down the suspect list to just one, Ivan Malat. Not only did Ivan fit the profile, but he had an extensive criminal career. Ivan and his brother Richard worked together in a road gang along the Hume Highway. He owned property in the vicinity of the forest and he recently sold his vehicle shortly after the discovery of the bodies. His family and acquaintances claimed he was obsessed with weapons. With Ivan on their radar, Paul flew to Australia to help with the investigation. On May 5th, 1994, Paul positively identified Ivan as his attacker from years before. Ivan was arrested on May 22nd at his home. A search of the home revealed a cache of weapons including parts of a 22 caliber rifle which matched the type used in the murders. He initially was arrested on robbery and weapons charges on May 23rd due to the investigation still being underway. But when police discovered clothing, camping equipment, and cameras belonging to several of the victims, he was formally charged with seven counts of murder on May 30th. His trial commenced in March of 1996 and lasted for 15 weeks. The defense argued that, in spite of evidence, there was no real proof of guilt and attempted to shift the blame to his brother Richard, who also had a crooked past. But on July 27, 1996, the jury found him guilty on all seven counts. He was also convicted of the attempted murder of Paul Onions. He received seven life sentences. Police believed Ivan may have been involved in many more murders, but due to a lack of evidence, this resulted in no further convictions on any other missing persons around the time. Many of the jurors believed Ivan couldn't have acted alone. Even his lawyer pointed at either Richard or one of his sisters, since he shared a house with them at the time. The key evidence of a co-conspirator, specifically his sister, is the presence of cigarette butts found at the Clark scene. Ivan didn't smoke, but his sister did. Police interviewed her and felt there was no reason to believe she had any kind of involvement. The same went for Richard. Ivan was incarcerated at the Maitland Correctional Center where he was beaten up and also attempted a breakout before being moved to maximum security at another facility. He attempted the appeals process a total of seven times with every single one being unsuccessful. He remained incarcerated in the maximum security prison in South Wales until his death in 2019. Ivan died from terminal esophagus and stomach cancer on October 27, 2019 at the age of 74. He provided no deathbed confession and continued to deny ever committing the murders. He showed no remorse, even opting to not have a priest present since he had nothing to confess. The horrific events of Wolf Creek are fictionalized, but it does draw inspiration from the real-life crimes. Ivan and Mick share kind of a similar look and have the same M.O.s, even down to the method of severing the spine. It's a gruesome flick, but it's definitely worth the watch, or rewatch if it's been a while for you. But let me know what you guys thought of this one and share your thoughts below and we can chat about it in the comments. And if you found this to be informational, please consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more. And if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Thank you to my wonderful community for all the love and support you continue to show me. You truly make my week. You guys are the best, and as always, I'll see you in the next one. Bye, friends.